the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this morning, our gospel passage for all saints is the pa- Matthew's account of Jesus' Beatitudes. And it's clear that these Beatitudes are very important to Jesus. After all, they're how Jesus chooses to begin his Sermon on the Mount which spans three whole chapters of Matthew's gospel. And I think most typically find the meaning of these nine sayings to be either completely mystifying and inscrutable, or even if we think we understand them, our interpretations tend to not be very life-giving or encouraging, which is probably a hint that our understanding may miss the mark. But since the Beatitudes begin Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which, again, is considered by many to be the single greatest spiritual and ethical teaching in the history of the world, and Jesus' manifesto on the way of eternal living he invites each one of us into, it seems, therefore, like it would be of vital importance for us as his disciples to get as clear as we can get about what Jesus is talking about here. And so this is my goal with this sermon today, which will follow actually the little table on the insert, uh, the wide insert in your bulletin. As I'll seek to illuminate the Beatitudes' true meaning. Well, at least the first three today, and then we'll finish up the last six in a few weeks. But on the insert, I've attempted to lay out the best understanding in sort of plain English of the first three Beatitudes in today's language based on the ancient and biblical understandings of the original Greek words, which have been in many ways sort of misinterpreted historically, it will probably lead to a much different understanding of these Beatitudes than's come to be commonly accepted or that we might think that they mean when we read them on our own. And to do this, I'm going to draw heavily from the scholarship of the Bible project, as I did in my sermon a month or so ago on getting the real meaning of turning the other cheek, which again is grossly misunderstood, but you'll have to check that sermon out. To be honest, to really dig deeply, though, into each one of these Beatitudes and all the linguistic and cultural reasons that these interpretations Um, that I'm going to propose are likely more faithful to Jesus' intent. To really get into that fully would take far too much time than we have today. I mean, I could do a sermon on each one of these, and I will spare you that. So going in depth, which maybe some of you might hunger for, would probably... would would require a full sermon on each one, and and maybe some summer I'll do a nine-week series. But today, I'm instead going to offer a reinterpretation of these first three with sort of a more limited explanation of each. And so my encouragement would be, rather than wondering about why I'm proposing and suggesting these sort of different interpretations, 
what could be the cultural, linguistic reasons behind that, I would instead just invite you to evaluate whether these reinterpretations ring more true than however you've understood these Beatitudes previously. See, if they feel like good news to you, where it hasn't in the past, see if they strike you as more consistent with the Jesus you know, and he's re- as he's revealed to us in the rest of the Gospels. Because my hope is that this will bring these Beatitudes to life for us in these two sermons. I think our previous understandings of them may have robbed us of the gift that they are, which is a stunning revelation that the good life Jesus invites us into is not contingent upon us having ideal life circumstances. The good life Jesus invites us into is not dependent upon us having ideal life circumstances. And so the first thing we need to do is get, get at what Jesus is up to with this phrase he repeats in each beatitude, this phrase, blessed are. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek and so on. See, the way this is often misunderstood is that Jesus is telling us what we can do if we want to be blessed. You want to be blessed? Well, make yourself poor in spirit, whatever that means. Right? I mean, what does that mean? You know, how do I make myself poor in spirit? Or if we want to be blessed, we'll mourn. Does that mean I just go around mourning all the time? Right? In reality, Jesus is not saying, do this and then you will be blessed. These are not commands he's giving. Instead, what he's suggesting is that the good life, the best life that he wants to lead all of us into more and more deeply, can surprisingly come to those whom the world would consider as having a terrible life. That's what we'll cover today. And then in the second sermon, it'll be that the good life can come to those who seek to conduct themselves in some particular ways that the world would deem as foolish. Now, I wonder if we could just take a minute, each one of us, to consider what we think of when we imagine the good life, the good life. What picture of the good life do you hold in your heart and your mind? Perhaps it's attaining a life of wealth and luxury. Perhaps it's just being able to go beyond sort of what our parents did, whether in terms of education or even a spiritual sense, spiritual maturity. Perhaps the good life we imagine is having opportunities for adventure and travel. Or perhaps it's having a united family or kids who think we're great and who make us proud. Anybody? Well, whatever we imagine the good life to be like, I bet it is nothing like the circumstances Jesus is going to describe for us in the first three Beatitudes that I'm going to unpack. However, Jesus actually didn't come up with this notion of listing what leads to the good life or what it could look like. In fact, our passage from Sirach today, you may have noticed, the writer Ben Sirah makes one such list of his own. Right? He says, I would consider nine conditions to be happy. And I'll name a tenth with my tongue. He's speaking sort of poetically. And his list includes when your children make you glad and having a, quote, sensible wife. Yikes. It seems like that ignorant trope about women being, quote, too emotional or whatever. It goes way back. He didn't have a very high view of women, we might say. Well, another good reason. Needless to say, the worldliness of this passage from Sirach seems like a good reason we don't consider it to be Holy Scripture. Amen. All right. So these, Sirach, Ben Sirach sort of represents just some of the worldly misconceptions of the good life that Jesus intends to turn upside down. 
Indeed, in these first three Beatitudes, Jesus is teaching that the truly good life is surprisingly available to to people who, from a worldly perspective, are completely without, whose life circumstances would be coveted by no one. So with the first one, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A very common interpretation of what it means to be poor in spirit is to be humble, right? And so when people mistakenly view these beatitudes as, as commands, as things Jesus is saying we need to do in order to be blessed, they've taken this to mean, well, be humble or make yourself humble and God will then bless you with the kingdom life. And so then people are left to figure out how on earth to do that. Right? How to make myself humble. Or, you know, we may have a sense of what that could be, but then how much humility is enough? When have we hit the appropriate level of humility to inherit these blessings, these supposed blessings? But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is instead describing people who are without and yet who can surprisingly experience the good life. And so the poor in spirit really refers to the downtrodden, to those who lack power, but it could be in a few different ways. Those who lack power economically, so let's say they're materially poor or impoverished, or those who lack power spiritually, right? So those who are struggling to believe in God at all, or struggling... To struggling with depression or struggling to live a godly life, right? You want to do the right thing, and like Paul says, you keep doing what you don't want to do. These are all different ways someone can be downtrodden, powerless to live the life they want, and certainly to live what the world views as the good life. And so it is shocking then. That Jesus is teaching in the first half of this beatitude that the good life belongs to those who are powerless, who are downtrodden economically or spiritually. And the reason the good life is available to them, and perhaps even more easily received by them, them, us, is because their difficult circumstance will allow them to easily grasp their need for God's reign in their lives, right? Their need for God to help them economically or their need for God to help them do what they, you know, not to do what they don't want to do or their need to take that, you know, live one more day amidst that overwhelming depression, right? In recognizing that need for God's reign in our lives is the path to the actual good life. Not what the world says the good life, right? And so as you can see on the insert regarding the first beatitude, I've summarized this reinterpretation as the good life belongs to those who are powerless economically or spiritually because they will more easily grasp their need for God's reign in their lives. Now, we could quibble over a few words there, but I'm trying to get at it. Hopefully, you're getting the drift. But on the flip side, to the extent that we may have some of the things that the world does see as marks of the good life, according to the world, I'm not saying we need to sell all those things, okay? Those things may be very good. Those things are things we can be grateful for. But I do think Jesus is calling us out of clinging too tightly to those things or pursuing them with all that much gusto as if they will give us true life. Because at the end of the day, they actually can't deliver the better life he has for us. Jesus' Beatitudes reveal the stunning truth that the good life he invites us into, the best life, is not dependent upon having ideal life circumstances. Okay, are we tracking? So the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, or probably better than mourn here is blessed are those who grieve, as far as how we kind of think about those words. Now, of course, the reason this grieving is an unenviable circumstance is because who the heck wants to grieve, right? I mean, I don't even need to ask for a show of hands here, right? Grieving is not fun, right? If we had the choice between going to the movies 
or grieving, what would we pick? Heck, if we had a choice between taking out the trash or digging a ditch or, or grieving, what would we choose? Probably not grieving, right? And yet, the reality is that our lives are filled with reasons to grieve, with losses that absolutely need to be grieved. And yet, so often, we avoid grieving at all costs. And to be fair, our Western society teaches us this, right? And yet, many of us, so many of us were never really taught how to grieve. And so, I'm not here to condemn that. I've been trying to learn how to grieve about the last 10 years. I was never taught. In the church upbringing. Grieving didn't happen. It wasn't mauled for me. And the church wants to ignore often, ignore the need for grief and just give you happy, clappy, Jesus died and rose. Okay, yeah. Interestingly, glancing back at that first beatitude for a moment, those who have power in the world, spiritual, economic, whatever, they're we, <laughs> We live in the richest country in the history of the world, we are more likely to skip over or avoid grieving because we have better things that can, we can turn our attention to instead to distract ourselves with, right? Whereas the downtrodden, the economically downtrodden, the depressed, whatever, they can't avoid their grief. It consumes their lives, right? And yet Jesus says the good life belongs to those who grieve. Why? Because the failure or inability to grieve loss will leave our souls disquieted, leave our souls, leave us without comfort. A capacity to grieve and a willingness to do it when we experience losses in our lives is critical. Not, I'm not just talking about losses of death, okay? Obviously, we're going to be acknowledging today people we love who've died. But in my sermon this past June on why it's so critical to be able to grieve for our spiritual growth, I contend that there are many other sorts of losses that we can face, that we will face in life, or can that merit grieving. Just a few examples. If we have changes in life where no one has done anything wrong, but it's just change, right? Change is a part of life. But again, neutral, not bad change, right? The kids going to school, right? Or growing up or moving out, right? Um, people dear to us moving away. Grieving that we can't control the decisions that loved ones make that may seem unwise to us. Grieving that we can't control or we know that controls the opposite of love, so Jesus calls us not to try to control, right? Or grieving some of the capacities we lose as we age or when health issues arise. These are just to name a few. But, I guess one more. A need to grieve is likely coming up for many of us. If not all of us, in some way, this week. When the results of Tuesday's election come in, whatever result any of us as individuals hope will happen, if that result doesn't come to pass, there are going to be a lot of different options for how we could respond to that, to that loss, that loss of our, what we're hoping for, whatever we attach to that, whatever we've attached to that hope, hope for outcome. So there's going to be all sorts of ways to respond, right? We could hate watch the situation on our preferred infotainment news channel. We could rage on Facebook. We could, uh, I don't know. I mean, y'all know, right? <laughs> we could cover it over with a good pint of ice cream. <laughs> what if instead we try grief, grieving? 
What if we try sitting in those difficult feelings, whatever comes up, turning to God in those, and receiving his comfort that it's going to be okay? At least it's going to be okay in a kingdom, eternal sense. Nothing can separate us from his love. Even if the worst outcomes that everybody's talking about happen with either direction, well, the Beatitudes are saying the good life is not dependent on external circumstances. Right? But really, as Christians, there's reason for all of us to grieve, whether the outcome you want to happen does or not, happens or not. Because none of the candidates or parties really have much capacity to make many changes for the biggest problems facing us in society, let alone the world, right? I mean, any of these folks going to end conflict in the Middle East, <laughs> right? Just one example, right, that we could all agree on that they're not going to fix, right? There's so many things Jesus calls us to care about that these folks and parties are impotent to do jack squat about, right? They can't agree on anything, right? And even if they could, they'd probably do the wrong thing. All right, shut up, John. So whatever the outcome or whoever our horse is in this race, we, all of us, can lament that incapacity that worldly political power has. And grieve for the masses, frankly, who fail to recognize how the power plays of donkeys and elephants will fail them. And they shouldn't be hoping in it because it'll fail them. Grieve for those who've yet to recognize and seize the alternative of pursuing Jesus' way of loving sacrifice instead of grasping for worldly power and outcomes. Because that ain't the good life. That's miserable, to be honest. That's a recipe for resentment and misery. Okay, I'm done talking about politics. For anything that comes up for us, where the best and healthiest response is to grieve, the tough reality is that we can only learn how to grieve by doing it, right? It's like learning how to snow ski, right? One of my kids one time, <laughs> I will not name, don't ask him about it. We were taking him to get snow skiing lessons and she, all my kids are girls, so I can say she, was like, oh, I know how to do this. I saw Curious George do it on the show, right? <laughs> it was awesome. It was so classic. Oh, okay, you know how to snow ski. We got up there, I mean, terror. Absolute terror, of course, right? Grief is similar. Well, especially because we're terrified of it usually. We can only learn how to grieve by doing it. And yet, if we balk at grieving at the losses that come our way, God's peace will prove increasingly difficult for us to hang on to. In a little bit, when we do go through the names of the dead and some names that are dear to us come up, maybe we can ask the Lord to show us if we've really grieved losing them. Or even if we have, you know, a lot of grief has a lot of waves to go through. Perhaps there is more grief to do. And so you'll see. On the insert, I've summarized the reinterpretation of the second beatitude as the good life belongs to those who grieve because the failure to grieve loss will leave our souls disquieted. Okay? All right, one more. The final circumstance we're covering today, the good life is surprisingly accessible to, is the circumstance of the meek. Now, again, this word meek in English, I mean, it really misses the mark. Maybe worse than any of them in all the Beatitudes. Why? Because the way we tend to imagine someone who's meek is someone who's sort of passive, sort of unassertive, right? At least that's how I've thought of it. Is Jesus passive or unassertive? Not the Gospels I read. And isn't the goal of Christianity to become more like Jesus with his help? So we know that's a bogus interpretation, right? However, a hint at how the Greek here is better understood is it comes in the second half of the Beatitudes. It says, for they will inherit the earth. And by the way, the Greek word translated earth here could be equally translated as land. Earth, land, either way. And that's significant. And that's because in Jesus' day, and really still today, 
owning land was not only the primary way to generate wealth, right, which it still is today, in addition to that, landowners sort of ran things in Jesus' society. I mean, they just did, right? I mean, under, that's how it works. And of course, with sinners, right, it was common for them to use their land ownership to oppress those who were without, who didn't own, with unjust rents and so on and so forth. And so the meek here really refers to those who in Jesus' day were not landowners, right, because the promise is they're going to inherit the land, right, and therefore they were on the margins. They were unimportant in society, right, or even afflicted by, again, injustice. And so here Jesus is saying that these unimportant will inherit the land in him, that the truly good life is available to them in that circumstance without it changing. Why? Well, because Jesus intends to lead them, to lead us into a new community of the church where there is not inequality, at least theoretically, (laughs) right? We're still sinners. There's not meant to be inequality based on class or wealth or all that kind of stuff. But where, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 that we looked at a few weeks ago, Everyone plays an equally important part, right? Using that metaphor, some, one person's the hand, one person's, you know, the foot, the eye, all that kind of stuff, that, that metaphor. As Tim Mackey says, if we could be a part of a community of people centered around Jesus, who are learning to share generously and learning to forgive and to love, and no matter what social rank we come from, we all sit at the same table and gather. Jesus is saying that's beginning to participate and experience heaven coming to earth. And in that sense, your life circumstance, no matter what it is, can therefore be said to be called the good life. And of course, then beyond this, I like that it could be earth Uh, land or earth, because beyond this, those who are in Christ will reign with him in the new heavens and the new earth. We will quite literally inherit the earth. And so the reinterpretation of this beatitude, which I actually kind of failed to, there's a few words I failed to include on the chart here. Here's how I would have said it. The good life belongs to those on the margins, the unimportant, and even the afflicted For in Christ, they will inherit community as God intended it, not as the dysfunctional world offers it or has it. Jesus' Beatitudes reveal the stunning truth that the good life he invites us into, the best life, is not dependent upon ideal circumstances. And so as we move into the subsequent Beatitudes of four through nine in a future sermon they're actually going to move away from circumstances of being without to followers of Jesus conducting themselves in some way, particular ways that the world thinks are stupid or foolish. We'll get to that in the other sermon. But for today, in these first three Jesus, he's shocking his audience there on the hillside and his disciples looking at all these people on the hillside. Because frankly, those people on the hillside with him fit these three categories, right? It's better than anybody (laughs) he could have talked to in those days. And so he shocks them by saying that they who have circumstances no one would envy can live the absolutely good life and best life in him, the kingdom life. Well, if we relate to any of that today, if we find ourselves feeling spiritually or economically downtrodden, if our lives are rife with grief or cause for grief, if we feel we've been marginalized by society or we find ourselves on the margins socially, Jesus wants us to catch the vision for how the path for the good life remains there for us in the midst of these challenges. And perhaps we can ask him to show us what a next step would look like toward living in that reality. I have a hunch what it would look like is a step toward greater vulnerability about our experience with God 
and other trustworthy believers. Do you want to grow spiritually? We, me, too. We want to grow spiritually. It's going to start with vulnerability. Being willing to name before God and other trusted believers what's really going on in here. What you're really terrified about. What you really struggle with. That's how we grow spiritually. And finally, for any ways we don't relate to the plights laid out in these first three Beatitudes, again, perhaps Jesus is calling us away from having our hope for the good life wrapped up in those worldly images of the good life. Right? Again, it's not that we should not be thankful for those things or whatever, but those images, those worldly images cannot bear the weight of, the need of our hearts for the good life. They will not fit it. So perhaps Jesus' call to us is away from living like any of those plights described in the first three Beatitudes are like the ultimate thing to be avoided, right? Because God promises to meet us in our messy realities and the truly good life is only attained as we find our rest in him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.